Hello, I'm Dr. Tom Chiller, Chief of the Mycotic Diseases Branch at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, Georgia. Welcome to this program on Valley Fever, timely diagnosis, early assessment, and proper management. Today, I'm thrilled to have with me two experts on Valley Fever, Dr. John Galgiani at the University of Arizona and Director of the Center for Valley Fever for Excellence. Welcome, John. Thank you. And Dr. George Thompson, <laughs> in the Division of Infectious Diseases at the University of California, Davis. Welcome to you both, and thanks for joining this educational activity on Valley Great. Fever. Before we start the conversation, I'd like to highlight that we're going to use a tutorial as an outline for this program uh, that was developed at the Valley Fever Center for Excellence with the help of CDC. This is a great resource to help learn how to recognize and manage patients with valley fever or coccidiomycosis. The tutorial in its expanded form is available at the website of the Valley Fever Center for Excellence. It uses a very useful acronym, which we're going to use throughout this program today, COCCI, C-O-C-C-I. C, consider the diagnosis. O, order the right tests. C, check for risk factors. C, check for complications and I initiate management. So let's start with a quick review about valley fever. Valley fever, or coccidiomycosis, which we often refer to as cocci, is caused by the fungi coccidioides immatus and coccidioides posidaceae. Although around 10 to 20,000 cases are reported to us at the CDC each year, we know that many more infections occur in the United States with estimates in the hundreds of thousands. This map shows our current understanding of the geographic range of valley fever, but we know and we are identifying the fungus in the environment beyond these historic areas. And the potential geographic range is much larger. This range is shown here on the graph in red. This is critically important for you and your understanding of this disease in order to identify people at risk. We know now that areas of risk are much more beyond the traditional uh, geography that has been described in the past. So, Dr. Galgiani, Dr. Thompson, John and George, let's begin this program and let's use the following outline. Remember, C, consider the diagnosis. O, order the right tests. C, check for risk factors, C, check for complications, and I, initiate management in our discussion today. So John, tell, me, tell us about the life cycle of valley fever. Yeah, well, uh, this is, as you mentioned, a fungus. It grows in the soil in certain parts of the country. Um, I live in one of those. George lives in another, uh, Central Valley, California, the, the southwest, and you really showed a nice map showing the expansion of that. Um, in the soil, it grows as a mold. It doesn't look any different, really, from bread mold. Uh, it's a mycelial growth. Uh, however, if you inhale one of these spores, and we think probably infection only takes one spore, uh, then uh, it does something unique to this genus, coccidioides. It rounds up, expands centripetally, and then invaginates internally. So you get hundreds of uh, daughter cells inside. We call those endospores. And that takes, at least in mice, about four days. And when one of those things ruptures, it comes out and you amplify that single colony forming unit to uh, really uh, two logs, maybe even more, uh, in four days. So four days, eight days, pretty soon you have a real disease. And the incubation time is one to three weeks. So tell us now a little bit about the spectrum of what that disease causes when these spores are actually dividing. Yeah, so it is possible to have high inoculum disease, but we think most people really get single spore infections. And even though it's this, you know, sort of point source, single spore start, the spectrum of this disease is amazing. Two out of three people really get no symptoms, at least no symptoms sufficient to send them to get medical attention. But that's one third who do get sick. And they typically have a community-acquired pneumonia syndrome. Um, and in fact, most of those, whether they're diagnosed or not, uh, which can last actually weeks to many months, um, uh, it eventually gets better on its own. And only a small percentage go on to have really spectacular complications. And we'll talk about what those are in a moment. But the vast majority are seen as a, as a clinical uh, community-acquired pneumonia. 
And what about symptoms? What kind of symptoms are we seeing yeah. with that community acquired pneumonia? Is there something unique to valley fever, or are we seeing very more general symptoms? Yeah, well, uh, most people look like they have pneumonia, and those symptoms are not specific. Uh, they they uh, are chest pain, cough, weight loss, night sweats. Uh, they feel like they have a respiratory illness. Uh, a small percentage of people, uh, it's actually, a, they're famous for this, have skin rashes, uh, a, a Synonym for valley fever is desert rheumatism, mm -hmm. and because joint complaints are very common. So those syndromes actually can have a uh, predominance and not have much of the pulmonary disease, but those associations uh, are really uh, the main spectrum of this disease. So when we're considering the diagnosis, what are we thinking about here? Well, uh, you, you just, you know, they come in looking like community acquired pneumonia. It could be a, a, a flu-like syndrome is often what the textbooks say, but I, my impression is that they're really a lot sicker than that. They tend to be walking pneumonia is a very common disease. In fact, in, in Arizona, one out of three uh, uh, people who are told they have pneumonia have that etiology be uh, coccidioides. So obviously the, the geographic range, as we talked about, is very important. So obviously travel history is something that we want to do when yeah. we're seeing these patients. Yeah, if you live there, it's a high likelihood. If the incubation is one to three weeks, uh, if you travel to see the Grand Canyon or go uh, to central Bakersfield, uh, you go home, if you get a pneumonia in the next uh, month, your chances are just the same as in uh, California or Arizona. So the C in Coxy, consider the diagnosis. Remember, think about the geographic range. Patients with respiratory symptoms, they can be very general. Patients with rheumatism-like symptoms, and you didn't mention, but rash is often commonly seen. Can right. you, can, George, can you tell us, I mean, do you, do you see rashes often in these patients? We do, and I think when, when someone presents with community-acquired pneumonia and they do have a rash, coxie really should be one of the, the things on the differential diagnosis for those patients, particularly if they're coming back from an endemic area or reside within the endemic region. And are there things, you talk about differential diagnosis, clearly this sounds like a very general symptomatology. What what do you use to help differentiate those with valley fever and those with other illnesses? Yeah, so again, I think the, the first C is essential. Consider the diagnosis, take an adequate travel history, but next is to order the appropriate test. Um, one thing that can be helpful is on their routine test, the presence of an eosinophilia just in their differential can, can sort of push you towards the possible diagnosis of COXI. Um, when you order um, more specific tests, you know, serology is really the mainstay uh, of diagnostics. And there's multiple different methodologies for that. In a lot of places, use an EIA-based method, um, particularly some of the, the larger um, reference centers, AREP, Quest, some, some of those. But the EIA is really a, a better screening test. It has a high sensitivity, but not as specific as some of the other methodologies. So complement fixation, immunodiffusion, those are generally thought to be much more specific for COXI. And, and complement fixation gives you a quantitative value that can be helpful prognostically, um, helpful sort of point you down different roads. Do you need to look for... Um, dissemination to other sites rather than just in the lung. And also complement fixation is very helpful to follow longitudinally while they're on therapy to see what their response is. And so, I, you know, I realize a lot of people probably don't understand and order these tests routinely. Is this something that you can just ask your laboratory? Is this test generally a send out? Are there certain laboratories you want to consider when you're ordering this test? And, you know, what, what is sort of the first line diagnostic? Mm -hmm. I think that really depends in this age of contracts what your hospital has a contract with. And if, if you're going to have a contract with one of the large labs, they're probably going to do an EIA-based method as a screen. And then most of those now send sort of for a confirmatory test to one of the specialized reference laboratories for complement fixation and immunodiffusion testing. So I think it's important for clinicians to have a good understanding um, of, of all three of those tests and their role in the management. So again, EIA more of a screening type test immunodiffusion and complement fixation more helpful for management and to follow patients. And so you didn't mention... Let me just, let me just yeah, add ahead, also John. that, you know, I, I agree completely. You may have, as a clinician on the front lines, you may have no control over mm -hmm. what tests you'll get back. Uh, the, the critical thing is to remember just to order it yes. and get a COXI antibody test. And then when it comes back, if something comes back positive, talk to somebody about how to interpret it. Yeah, and it's, it's again key if you get a negative test result, that, that's not always sort of the end of their diagnostic workup. Again, some, some of these patients, if you order a test a little bit too early, you're probably going to need to repeat their serology testing two to three weeks later. So you guys have talked about serology, which sounds like it's the most important thing to think about. But what about 
culture in this organism? Do you find it in microscopy? Do you, do you, is there much success in trying to get a culture? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so again, cultures are, are routinely taken for a lot of patients with community-acquired pneumonia, so coxie may even be spuriously found on, on those cultures, and of course that, that confirms the diagnosis of coxie in these patients. Um, you know, it, using culture alone as a diagnostic modality is, is probably not that helpful. Most of the patients do not have positive respiratory cultures, which is again why we prefer a non-invasive non method, method such as ser serologic testing. Um, the interesting thing about, about cultures or even biopsy of a suspicious lesion is that coxie has a very characteristic appearance on microscopy of those. You know, these, these spherules are very large, up to 80 microns in size. Um, you can see we have a, a nice diagram of one that's rupturing. You can see sort of what John alluded to with this very rapid logarithmic um, growth. We're releasing, you know, hundreds, even thousands of endospores per sort of ch changeover in this life cycle. So cultures can be really helpful if they're positive. If they're negative, they're not that helpful. The patient still may have coxie and, again, needs serologic testing for diagnosis. Diagnosis. So sort of to summarize again, the O, order the right tests, and, and that really starts with serologic testing. Great. So if laboratory tests establish a diagnostic, right, the next thing to, for us to think about is to see if the patient has certain risk factors. And John, tell us about risk factors that make right. coxie worse. Well, there are several, but the absolute overwhelmingly biggest one is immunosuppression mm -hmm. due to a lot of different things, um, HIV, <laughs> back, pre-heart. Um, uh, immunosuppression from organ transplantation, those are famous for risk factors where complications occur many score more frequently. I mean, it's just a really obvious risk factor. Uh, now, these days, anti-TNF therapies, uh, on the news you hear, Absolutely. tell your doctor if you live in an area where fungal infections are common, they're talking about our area. <laughs> Uh, as well as some others, but certainly coxie would be one of those things on those differentials. So there's many different uh, rheumatologic uh, therapies and so forth. Any of those should be triggers for major high risk uh, for dissemination uh, and other complications. I, I also mentioned that diabetes is also done. Actually, it's not really a risk for disseminated disease. It, it's uh, pretty clear, though, it's uh, associated with increased complications in pulmonary disease. What about pregnancy? I know pregnancy is a category that those of us who are treating valley fever worry about. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, if someone has an uncontrolled uh, coxy infection before pregnancy or acquires coxy during pregnancy, those patients don't generally do that well. They have a lot more complications of disease, um, a much more drawn out course, and, and in some cases even do have dissemination outside of the lung during pregnancy um, for a lot of reasons that are sort of physiologically interesting. Um, but really one of the key points from this is to remember that the triazole therapy, which is really the backbone of therapy for coxie, are teratogenic, particularly in the first trimester. And there's some debate about if we can use those in the second and third trimester. Um, but but triazole therapy during pregnancy is, is generally not recommended. And so what about other risk factors uh, that are not maybe disease associated as you guys? Yeah, well, uh, there's genetics here. Uh, we think that the reason some people get bad disease and some don't is because of genetics. Um, and in fact, it's pretty clear that men are much more likely to disseminate than women. And uh, there's a, a lot of uh, uh, epidemiology suggesting that African Americans and uh, Filipinos especially are more likely to have disseminated disease. But but the effect of those factors are not nearly as huge as the effect of immunosuppression, diabetes, and probably pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Great. So the third C, check for risk factors. Um, we're going to want to really think about immunosuppressive states, as John mentioned. Also worry a little bit about diabetes. Pregnancy is a condition that we definitely need to take special account of. And you just mentioned that gender and race ethnicity might also play a role in, as you're thinking about these patients. So even in the absence of risk factors um, that we've been mentioning, uh, there can still be dissemination and uh, pretty uh, severe disease involvement. So uh, tell us, John, what do these sort of complications look like? Yeah, well, um, it's, it's, as it turns out, the complications of valley fever tend to occur in the first weeks to months after the infection. It's very different from tuberculosis, for example, where you famously have decades go by and then you have reactivation disease. And, and what you're really looking for is pretty easily screened by a good uh, history and uh, physical and a review of systems. You're looking for focal kinds of symptoms or signs. This disease, when it causes disease, when the bug is growing, it causes tissue destruction. And that, uh, there's a big recruitment of neutrophils, and you can see that. It, things are swollen, they hurt. Uh, so, for example, if somebody has an unexplained swollen knee, you'd want to think about that as a complication of the newly diagnosed valley fever. 
back pain, think about a vertebral lesion. A headache, actually headache occurs 20% of the time, mm -hmm. uh, but most of those people don't have meningitis, but you have to make a decision which of those people to tap. And so when you're, when you're, when you're doing a, a physical exam, are there some specific places, you just mentioned a few, but are there some specific places where, you're, where you focus when you're looking for that kind of focal lesions, either of you? Yeah, I think, again, you know, John did a great job. The review of systems is really what's essential. You know, patients do complain of areas that, that are likely to be infected. You know, it's not useful to do sort of a very large-scale radiologic search for active disease um, or, or to do lumbar punctures on patients, you know, just for all comers. The patients will complain of areas where there's dissemination. So, so the review of systems really is key. But I generally focus on headache and neurologic symptoms to, to look for complications of extrapulmonary disease, um, ask a lot of questions about skin or particularly lesions that won't heal, and then, um, again, you know, desert rheumatism came up, and that can be a fairly benign course and part of the immunologic course of COXI, but it can also, um, for, for something like a swollen knee, represent a, a side of um, extra pulmonary coccidiomycosis. So those are really key things to focus on. Yeah, maybe I could just say aches and pains are famous with this disease. Mm, absolutely. What they typically are are symmetrical, and def uh, they come and go to different places. They do not cause tissue destruction. So if you see a, a one, one joint or one part of the bone that hurts, uh, and it stays there and slowly gets worse at, in association with the newly diagnosed disease. Yep. That's kind of what you're looking for is something to pay particular attention to. Now I know that uh, thankfully the risk for meningeal involvement is quite rare, but just, you know, just briefly tell us a little bit about coxie meningitis, which is a challenging entity to manage. Yeah, absolutely. The management really is difficult, but I think that, that really um, early diagnosis is key for this group. And again, a lot of these patients with primary disease and that will not go on to have complications do have headache. But it's the patients that have persistent headache for, we for weeks or even months that, that really meningitis needs to be explored as a possible complication of disease. And, and again, for clinicians, it's important to remember coxie meningitis is very different than pneumococcal or meningococcal meningitis when they come in very acutely ill, very sick. Coxie is a chronic meningitis, so, so often patients will go by with, with symptoms for several weeks or months that have really not been explored. Um, so it's important, again, a very good review of systems and, and to really explore those with persistent symptoms. So uh, good to hear about some of these rare complications, but bringing it back a little bit to the lung mm -hmm. where we initially get our disease. Tell, tell me about some of the pulmonary complications mm -hmm. we can see with coxie. Yeah, so again, community-acquired pneumonia is by far the most common. Um, I think really probably the, the most easy to address, but really the complications of that, they can have pleural involvement, which can be difficult to manage, require the assistance of the thoracic surgeons. Um, patients with a high inoculum can come in with ARDS and end up intubated in the ICU. Um, other types of just really diffuse acute pneumonia um, can be difficult to manage. And then um, some of the more interesting um, aspects of COXI is, is some of these patients with diabetes will go on to have cavitary disease, um, really which needs to be followed you know, clinically and radiographically over time during therapy. Um, and then the last complication really that's important to document is to follow these um, radiologic manifestations to, to really to resolution and, and often the, the area of pneumonia will resolve to a nodule. And if you follow those to resolution, that can really avoid an oncologic workup, you know, 20 years down the road if you tell these patients this nodule is from your recent coxie infection. And so uh, treatment is clearly different for the different entities. Are, are we talking about potentially long uh, durations of mm -hmm. antifungal therapy in some of these patients? Yeah, again, I think it really depends, you know, how severe was their initial manifestation of disease. If patients come in with very mild symptoms, a lot of them don't need to be treated at all. When they come in with much more um, acute symptoms, a much larger, larger burden um, radiographically or symptom-wise, we do treat, you know, generally all of those patients. And then the duration of therapy differs, and it really is very individualized. I generally treat most patients for at least three months. A lot of them get up to six months. Um, and then if they have a complication of disease, um, really you need to weigh the pros and cons of ever stopping therapy and have a long discussion with the patient about those things. And so, maybe, maybe I yeah, could just ahead, say, John. we're focusing here on the most common forms of this disease, and, and most people fortunately don't get that. Mm -hmm. But when they do get that, um, that starts to become really subspecialty referrals. Yeah. And, and those people, I, I think uh, in a primary care setting, you definitely want to have either a pulmonary or infectious disease or some other consultant familiar with this disease to mm -hmm. hold your hand to, yeah. to get through these complications. So that fourth letter, fourth C, mm -hmm. C, check for complications. Clearly you guys have both outlined that it's critically important to look for these complications. And I think, John, as you just mentioned, and George, I'm sure you would agree, enlisting the help of, a, of expert clinicians, mm -hmm. infectious disease docs that could be pulmonary docs is really important for taking care of these complicated patients. 
So we just talked about now sort of the more challenging cases, but John, you already mentioned to us earlier that really most of these patients present with either a primary respiratory sort of syndrome or even a community-acquired pneumonia. How are you going to manage right. the typical patient, I should say? Right. So if, you know, you showed statistics of 10 to 20,000 people being diagnosed a year, and it's probably two, three times that much if all the cases were actually diagnosed at the, at the front lines, that a lot of those patients ought to, I think, stay in primary care. Uh, and so if they don't have any of those complications we talked about, if they don't have those risk factors, then, and if uh, at th that point I think um, it should be possible that primary care just take care of those patients because the first thing is to make a diagnosis. And that allows you to give prognosis to your patient, tell them what to expect, allay fears, dispel concerns sometimes of cancer, mm -hmm. uh, other problems, you know, the unknown is a big problem. Just giving a diagnosis to somebody is m huge. It also allows you to stop all sorts of further diagnostic tests. You've got an answer. And stop all of those therapies you might have been using, like antibiotics for bacterial infections, uh, which really are going to not help, help somebody who has a fungal infection. So uh, I think making a diagnosis whether or not you treat the patient uh, is huge for the patient and uh, probably saves a lot of money uh, because of all the unnecessary things you can stop doing. And so the sooner you make that diagnosis, I think, the better. Yeah. And so when you're just as general management of these patients, what are, what are some of the things that you're doing uh, or that you would recommend a primary care doctor do while they're managing someone? Yeah, well, follow-up is probably critical. Um, George mentioned that already, um, that it, it, this is a pneumonia that you want to see get better. And um, I follow with an x-ray, not terribly frequently. CAT scans are probably not needed once the diagnosis is made unless you start having new complications uh, and things. You need that kind of detail. So PA and lateral once in a while, maybe three or four weeks after the diagnosis, again, three or four months later. And as George says, one I, can't, I, I recommend about a year later just to see if there's a residual nodule, mm -hmm. which you know what it is now and needs no further workup. Uh, follow up with serologies. The, uh, George mentioned they tend to go high when people are complicated, uh, so watching them become normal again is really reassuring, especially really the, the only test to do is the complement fixation and titer, the one that 1 to 4, 1 to 8 test. Um, but it's actually not the diagnosis, it's not the disease, it's, it's, a, it's a marker. So sometimes patients, and George might speak to this, sometimes the, the serology goes up and the patient is getting better and the patient's the rule. You know, follow the patient, not so much the serology. Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, again, you know, just like John said, the patient's symptoms are critical for what's to follow. If their titer's still 1 to 8, but the patient has no symptoms, you know, we can sort of ignore the serologic titer at that time. But, again, you want to see it come down over time, and it is useful to, to sort of follow these patients longitudinally with that. But, again, patient symptoms are key to follow long-term. And so, in talking about serology for a moment, we know this is not a perfect test. We know that there, it's hard to find perfect tests out there. Um, but if you, if you have a patient that has the geographic risk, that you're concerned really does have valley fever, but has a negative serology, mm -hmm. how do you approach that patient? I know that's a challenging question, but I want to hear from both of you. Well, yeah. I see it in my clinic all the time. Uh, in, the bad news is you don't know what's going on. But the good news is that if it's valley fever, you can manage it as a patient there, who doesn't have complications. You can't find the lesions. Uh, who uh, doesn't have the risk factors. And so I manage them supportively. And one of the commonest symptoms and sometimes the most impacting is fatigue. And I treat those with physical therapy and reconditioning because the fatigue will lead to deconditioning. And you can do something about that. I can't do anything about the disease fatigue. Mm -hmm. But once that's gone away, the person's deconditioned. They may never have been deconditioned before in their life. They don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. And physical therapy in that setting really helps. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's really a key consideration. Again, symptom focused uh, for those patients, and, and you know, generally these patients are are not that ill when they first come into the clinic to see, and you do have some time to wait on, you know, serologic testing or even to repeat serologic testing in a few weeks. But yeah, you're, you're absolutely right, Tom. We have no perfect test quite yet, um, but again, just general treatment, risk factors, um, and, and some time to sort of sort of things out are, are really uh, available for most of those. So I didn't, John. I didn't hear you mention anything about antifungal <laughs> therapy for these patients. So, so uh, let me turn it to George. Then, George, are you, you have this primary patient with a respiratory disease, no complications. Mm -hmm. Do you consider using antifungal therapy or not? 
Um, yeah, so I think, again, it really depends on the degree of symptoms. If they have a lot of symptoms with fatigue, um, still have fevers, weight loss, and they do have a confirmed at least serologic test for, for coxie, I generally do treat those patients. I don't know that I improve their symptoms more rapidly than if they didn't get treated, but fluconazole is generally a fairly affordable medication. Um, it, it's generally devoid of side effects for most patients. Um, so, so in the absence of a clinical trial, which we'll talk about later, um, I, I generally do treat patients if they have enough symptoms to warrant treatment. Well, now is later. Tell us about this clinical <laughs> yeah. trial. You yes, we've been very fortunate, I think, really with the partnership with the CDC, a lot of experts around the country. Um, we've been able to design, you know, a prospective placebo-controlled trial for patients that come in with community-acquired pneumonia that's actually from COXI. Um, and, and we're hopeful that this will answer a lot of these questions. Does, does treatment actually help improve the rapidity in resolution of symptoms or not? And that's an answer we don't know. It's been debated for a long time, but we're very hopeful that this, this trial and I'm very grateful for the NIH's full support for this, um, that this will answer some of these age-old questions in the field. So then to summarize, our final and fifth letter, mm -hmm. I, initiate management, mm -hmm. what would you say the summary of this discussion has been? Yeah, I think that's a really individualized approach and depends where, where you're used to practicing. And well, so we, we, I think you've heard, I think we would pretty much agree, you, you want to make a diagnosis, you support the patient, um, you, you give them prognosis, um, you stop using antibiotics, mm -hmm. Uh, you make sure no new complications occur over the next year or two. Um, there's disagreement because there's no data on whether or not to treat patients. Uh, so the spectrum is all over the map. Mm -hmm. um, but I, 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 you can make a case that if you think somebody needs treatment, that that should be a referral patient. Mm -hmm. But others would say it should be just part of primary care. Mm -hmm. Well, I certainly look forward to the data coming out mm -hmm. from that AH yeah. trial. Thanks for addressing these challenging subjects of treating primary disease. Um, it's incredibly important to report this disease because it gives us at CDC a better idea about how much disease is occurring. Coccidioidomycosis, or coxie, is a reportable condition in many states. And so please contact your local or state public health department if you have a case to report them so we can learn more about the true burden of this disease. So I think we had a nice discussion today uh, about valley fever. Um, it represents a substantial public health problem. I think because the clinical nature of this disease is one that looks like many other diseases, it's going to be important for you, the clinician, to think about this disease and be aware that it is probably occurring in patients that either are from areas where valley fever occurs or have traveled to a region. So remember, early diagnosis, accurate diagnosis is essential for understanding this disease and for managing this disease. Early identification of valley fever is important for several reasons. It allows you, one, to know what the patient has, and as John and George have both mentioned, that's key in the management because then it eliminates the need for unnecessary antibacterial use, reduces the need for additional diagnosis and diagnostic tests, and helps you decide on an early management strategy, including dealing with complications. Clinicians should maintain a high level of suspicion for valley fever in patients that have lived in the geographic areas where we know COXI occurs or who have traveled recently to an area where we know valley fever occurs. Remember, ask about travel history and please think about the expanding geographic areas that we mentioned earlier in this program. So, remember the acronym COXI, C-O-C-C-I for primary care of coccidiomycosis. C, consider the diagnosis. O, order the right tests. C, check for risk factors. C, check for complications. And finally, I, initiate management. Well, John, George, I want to thank you guys for participating today. This has been fun yeah. and interesting conversation about yeah. this important yeah, disease. Yeah, thank you. And I also want to thank Orion McCotter at the CDC, who has worked tirelessly behind the scenes to make this program possible today. And, of course, thank you for participating in this activity. 